says in Psalms 24, it declares the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. He created you, he created me, he created everything. That means no issue, no problem to come against you. Hallelujah. The earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's. For you, we're here for you. Ooh. Yes, the world will bow down and say you are God. Every man will bow down and say you are a king. So let's start right now. Why would we wait? King of glory, feel this place. I just want to be.
just want to be with you. Just want to be with you. Oh, Lord, King of glory, please fill this place. Just want to be with you. Just want to be with you. Good morning and welcome to the Metropolitan AME Zion Church here in Hartford, Connecticut. Our online virtual worship experience where when you come our way, you make our day. This is the day that the Lord has made and together we will rejoice and be glad in it. Come, let's rejoice now as we sing together that wonderful hymn of the church. Hymn number 33, all hail the power of Jesus' name. And after that, singing Sister Dahlia will lead us in the affirmation of faith. Let's sing unto the Lord.
Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now reverently and sincerely declare the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our anthem offering today is a wonderful arrangement of Psalm 150 offered today by the Trinity Choir and Sanctified Symphony Orchestra of Alfred Street Baptist Church, Washington, D.C. And after that blessing, Reverend Martin Jackson will read for us our lesson from God's Word.
Today's scripture lesson is taken from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16 verses 13 through 19. And it reads as thus. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. May the Lord God add a blessing to his word and a blessing to your day. Amen. The anointed saying of the Lord, or Loretta Agite from Accra, Ghana, blesses us as we prepare our hearts to center and to pray. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus says the Lord. After the century, Rembedi Lu Kata will lead us in our talk with the Lord. Let's center and let's pray. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word and just to rest all upon his promise just to know that says the Lord tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just 
Good morning, my father's children. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are truly thankful that you have allowed us to see another day. We say thank you. Father God, we are so thankful for who you are, the great I am. You are the creator. You are our God and you are our Father. And we thank you, Father God. We thank you for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us, Father God. We know that your love is unconditional, and so we thank you for that love. We thank you how you continue to keep us, Father God, that we know that um, you are our ever constant friend. We can call on you at any time of the day or now, night, and you are right there. Thankful that you neither sleep nor slumber, and that you don't go on vacation, you don't have a staycation, but you're there for us, and we're thankful. We thank you, Father God, that we have a place to worship. We may not be in the physical building, Father God, but in our homes. I pray right now that the homes are consecrated to worship you, to praise you. You are holy and we come this day to worship and praise you in the spirit that you have given each of us. And so thank you. Thank you, Father God, for your son, Jesus, whose love is unconditional. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the price that you paid for us. We thank you for taking away the sins of the whole world. Thank you, Father God, for your son, Jesus. Then Jesus, here too, we are so thankful that you love us so much that as you ascended into heaven to be on the right hand of God the Father, that you sent us the Comforter. You sent us the Holy Spirit. And so here too, we are truly thankful but we're also mindful that you will return, Lord Jesus. And we are, we want to be the children of, of God so that when you do return, that you will find us here. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for answered prayers. We've been praying for those who are sick, those who are shut in, those who are homeless, those who are go to bed uh, hungry at night. We pray for them, we lift them up to you, Father God, but there is a work for us to do as well. We are our brother's keeper. And so whatever we do, we do it to the glory of God. For God's grace and his mercy that he has showered on us, we want to do the same for our brothers and our sisters who are in need. And yes, we are in need of a healing, Father God. There's some of us whose body is And pray for healing. There are those who are in the valley of decision who need to have their mind regulated to hear your voice. That as they go to you, that they will hear your voice, Father God. And then, Father God, we're, we're thankful again that you have allowed us to come together one more time and that we can come to you in prayer with any and everything. Father God, we give it to you. And then, Father God, we thank you how you have blessed Metropolitan, blessed the Metropolitan family and, and her friends. We thank you, Father God, for those who, are, who join in with us this day for worship. We thank you, Father God, how 
you continue to protect the the shepherd of this household, the angel of this household, Reverend Jones, Father God, how you continue to bless him, how you continue to keep him healthy. We thank you for him and his leadership, Father God. We don't take that for granted, that we have excellent leadership here, here because of your son, Jesus, and because Reverend Jones' focus is on our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. And then we thank you for his family. We pray a special prayer of hedge of protection around them. Father God, bless them in a special way. And then Father God, we, we lift up the ministerial staff, every officer, every lay person, our guests, Father God, we lift them up to you this day that you might continue to bless them. We especially lift up our seniors those persons who may not be able to get out it. We want to reach out to them, let them know that they are still vital to the church, the church of Jesus Christ. And then Father God, we plead the blood of Jesus over our children's lives for this, this world is not friendly to our children. And so we plead the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus over their lives. Thank you for blessing our many efforts here and our many ministries here at Metropolitan, Father God. We thank you how you continue to bless us, all of our efforts. We thank you for willing hands to work for the kingdom of God here on earth. And then, Father God, we pray this day that wherever your name is called, wherever your name is lifted up, wherever your name is exalted this day, that you be pleased with us. Again, you are our God. And we just thank you for who you are. So very thankful. We're thankful that we have someone that we know we can count on, depend on. You are a promise keeper that you will neither leave us nor forsake us. And thank you for that love, that unconditional love. And now, Father God, for this waiting congregation to hear from you through the willing vessel. We pray for the vessel this morning, Father God, that be used by and of you, and that you get the glory. You get the glory of all of our work, but we do this in the name of Jesus. And that name, that name is the only name, the only name that matters. We offer this prayer in that name, in the name of Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. Jesus. Jesus 
trust Him more. Oh, for grace to trust Him. I need Your grace, God. Yeah, grace. Oh, Your grace to trust You more. I need Your grace to trust You more, God. Our preacher this morning is no stranger to those of us here at the Metropolitan Church. She was scheduled to preach, of course, on last Sunday, and due to technical glitch, we were not able to hear that word. But I asked her to be prepared to do it today, and I'm very grateful for the Reverend Patricia Flowers. She's recently come back to our congregation and will become a part of the ministerial team again soon. But this morning, she's our preacher. I always say, if you pray for the preacher, God will use the preacher and will bless us. And so after the selection, the sermonic selection, rendered by Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, he's God talks about how we come into his presence, lift up holy hands and worship him. After that singing, hear the preacher, the Reverend Patricia Flowers, who shall bless us as God leads her. Amen.
Good morning, Metropolitan, again. Officers, ministerial staff in the pulpit, ministerial staff and the laity and to the members of this great church. I greet you once again in the name of he who redeemed me, saved me, sanctified me and keeps me sanctified with his blood that was shed for me and for you on the cross. That name is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. To our pastor, the Reverend Dr. Terry L. Jones Sr., for whom I have great admiration, great love, thank you again for welcoming me back to the Met and for allowing me the awesome privilege to stand behind this sacred desk once again to give a word. To the First Lady of the Met, Donzia Jones, in whom I recognize a kindred spirit in the chat during Sunday morning worship, in that we seem to have similar praises, similar responses to the praise and to the prayers and to the preach word during Sunday morning service. I greet you, my sister. To the offsprings, TJ, Justin, and Joshua, I greet you, my brothers. TJ, as I said last week, I thank God for your tech ministry. Your ministry has moved the church beyond the walls and who knows how many will be saved, how many will give their life to Christ by your labor in the vineyard. There is a word from the Lord. Pray for me as I pray for myself. Consecrate me, Lord, to thy service now. By the power of grace divine, let my soul look up with the steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine. Empty me of self, Lord, and fill me with yourself that your word might go forth with truth and with power. Amen. The scripture has been read for you by Reverend Jackson, Reverend Martin Jackson, from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, verses 13 through 19. A scripture that every believer in the body of Christ should be familiar with. I will simply lift up from the reading verses 15 through 19. In verses 15 through 19, reading from the New King James Version, Jesus poses the question to his disciples subsequent to the answer to Jesus' first question to them, who do people say the Son of Man is? After their answer, Jesus asked them again, well, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The subject the Lord gave me to expound on from the scripture this morning is seeking what's good for the church. Seeking what's good for the church. Church leaders of all sects in the United States and I'm sure globally are scurrying for ways to do ministry and what has been labeled by some the post-pandemic church. The ultimate concern of most of these leaders is how are they going to retain members who are still hanging on through virtual engagement, usher them back into the sanctuary of their local churches, and regain the members who are being fed through other virtual ministries. One church leader commented, Join us for worship on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock a.m. at 123 Highway Avenue. We'll no longer be a draw to the physical church because everyone knows whatever message you're preaching will either be live streamed or available, available later via video. Since the COVID pandemic has forced the church to go virtual, Members now know they don't have to go to a building, come to a building to engage or give their life to Christ. Another church leader abruptly said, it's true 
that the mission of the Christian church is to win souls for Christ? But in 2021, if coming to Christ means coming to your church in a set location, in a set hour, you need a new strategy. I agree. What should this new strategy look like? What strategy should be employed in seeking what's good for the church and this so-called post-pandemic era? A text in the Gospel of Matthew 16, 13 through 19 gives us some insight on what this strategy should be. In our text, we find Jesus questioning his disciples to see if they really have an understanding of who Jesus is. When Jesus poses an inquiring question, who do you say that I am, directly to his disciples, Simon Peter gives a well-known response, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus responds to Simon Peter, blessed are you, Simon by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. There are a variety of interpretations and debates over what Jesus meant when he said of Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. Some say Jesus made this disclosure premised on Peter's faith when he confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. Others say Jesus was bilingual and he simply used the Aramaic translation for Peter, which is rock. Further up in the text at verse 17, Jesus refers to Peter as Simon by Jonah, where he says, blessed are you Simon by Jonah for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. This is where Peter's multiple names gets interesting. Addressing Peter as Simon by Jonah the Bajona pot was a cultural custom of that era and still is today in many countries in which a son or daughter is addressed by the parent's name. For instance, Peter's father's name was more than likely Jonah. Not that Jonah who got captured in the whale, but another Jonah. Ba in Aramaic, the language Jesus spoke means son of. And so in addressing Peter as Simon by Jonah, Jesus was addressing Peter as Simon, son of Jonah. The name Simon, though, is a name we really should be homing in on. The name Simon derives from the Greek vernacular, and it means listening or hearing, to hear. Thus, when Jesus addresses Peter as Simon by Jonah, upon Peter's confession, Jesus was actually saying, blessed are you, Simon. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You have heard from my Father in heaven. This text lets us know that when Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, it really wasn't about Peter's name. It was about who Peter named as the Christ, the Son of of the living God. That's what got Jesus excited. Jesus built his church on Peter's revelation, not on Peter's faith, not his name, but on what Simon by Jonah heard God say, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter's revelation moved Jesus to give Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Take note that Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not keys to the kingdom of heaven. He gave Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Of is a proposition that expresses the relationship between a part and a whole. To be a part is to be a piece that combines with other pieces to form the whole of something. So when Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Upon Peter's revelation, Jesus invited Peter into a partnership with him to establish his church. Letting Peter know, my church is part you, Peter, and part me. We're partners now. We're in 
a relationship. Of is also a proposition indicating an association between two entities and is used after the name of someone to introduce the institution or place they belong to. An entity could be a single person or a single organization. Thus, when Jesus gave Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus granted Peter citizenship in his kingdom because an association is defined as an organization of people with a common purpose and having a formal structure. Peter and Jesus had a common purpose to build the church. And we know the kingdom of heaven is a formal structure because the apostle John had a revelation from Jesus on the island of Patmos. John testifies his revelation in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, where John declares, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard, I heard, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. So not only was Peter and Jesus partners in building the church Jesus intended to be built, but now Peter was a participating member of the kingdom of heaven, since heaven is the institution Jesus descended from. Also take note, Jesus gave Peter keys of the kingdom of heaven, not a key, but keys which suggests to me that these keys were and are multi-purpose keys for the multi-purpose challenges Peter would encounter while expanding the mission of the kingdom in the earth realm. Peter's revelation also moved Jesus to bestow upon Peter a ministry, which was to build a church. And he bestowed upon Peter the gift of an apostle to effectuate that ministry. Peter's gift of an apostle worked to inaugurate Christ's church on the day of Pentecost, which is recorded in the book of Acts chapter two, where the power of the Holy Spirit was dispatched from the kingdom to stir up Peter's gift, causing 3,000 souls to come to Christ. Moreover, not only did Jesus give Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, access to power and the gifted ministry, Jesus also granted Peter authorization to use those multi-purpose keys to fortify his ministry. In the tech world, Mr. Terry, authorization is described as a security mechanism, a system used to determine user client privileges to access certain levels related to the system's resources. Security systems protect com computer systems and information from harm, theft, and unauthorized use. By giving Peter the, the, the keys to authorization to bind and to loose, as it reads in the text, he essentially created a security system for Peter's ministry by giving Peter the authority to bind up whatever in the earth came against his ministry, and as he did, it would be bound in the kingdom and the authority to lose the hidden treasures stored in the secret places in the kingdom to fortify his ministry, and as he did, they would be loosed in the kingdom. For as the prophet Isaiah's word is, is proclaimed to the Israels in Isaiah 45, it stood true for Peter and still stands true for us today. God said, I will give you the hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord. Peter now had authorization to access these treasures. So how is Peter's revelation relevant today as we seek what's good for the church? Our text this morning impresses upon me to urge three criteria for an answer to this question. The first criterion for seeking what's good for the church today is we need to wait for a revelation from the Lord for ministries that will bear fruit. Christ built his church on Peter's revelation and for over 2,000 years, the church of Christ continues to bear fruit. 
Out of Peter's revelation came the universal church, the local church, the district church, the house church, and the storefront church, the cathedrals, and, and the mega church. And today, I stand participating in the virtual church. Out of these churches came ministries to the poor and the rich, ministries to the oppressed and those in prison, ministries in the halls of con Congress, ministries in homeless shelters, global ministries to feed the hungry, social justice ministries to advocate for the downtrodden. And seeking what's good for the church today, church members need to wait for a revelation from God for ministries that will bear fruit. I think about my good sister, the Reverend Robin Anderson, who pastors Blackwell Amy Zion Church, located at 682 Blue, Blue Hills Avenue in Hoffman, Connecticut. She's doing a miraculous work, you have to see it. Lifting the congregation from the lower level of the edifice to the upper room, street level, where the community can see the work of God's power in their, hand, in their midst. I was in Zion for 32 years prior to my furlough by the Lord, and I witnessed good pastors appointed to Blackwell who had a desire to bring the sanctuary of the church to the upper room. They had a genuine desire, but evidently, they did not have the revelation. I asked the good Reverend, what compelled you to, to renovate the upper room at Blackwell? And she replied, I heard God say, it's time to go to the upper room. And they're almost done. She heard, like Simon by Jonah heard, what God said. That's a revelation. Black world can definitely be described when it opens its doors again as a post-pandemic church. And it would be good for the church to move to the upper room, a fruit of my sister's ministry because she had a revelation. The second criterion is to seek them was good for the church. Not only do we need a revelation from God, the ministry, but we also need authorization to sustain the ministry. Jesus gave Peter authorization to use the power of the keys of heaven to bind adversity and loose resources in order to keep his ministry moving forward. My sister's pastor in Atlanta, Georgia said, when God gives his people an assignment, we can expect an enemy to be attached to it. I know that's right. So we need authorization to bind the enemy and loose the victor who has overcome the enemy, and that victor is Jesus, the Christ. Simon Bajon is Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. But how, how, how do we obtain this authorization? Well, that's the third criterion for seeking what's good for the church. It's a third criterion, but it actually comes before the second criterion, which is authorization. So, first we need a revelation from God to ministry. We need authorization to defend and fortify our ministry. And thirdly, we will need authentication in order to access the authorization to use those multi-purpose keys of the kingdom. In the tech world, authentication is a process of recognizing a user's identity. It is a process that determine, determines whether users are who they claim to be. Authentication actually comes before authorization to the system is granted. It verifies whether access is allowed. Peter's revelation that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, was all the author authentication he needed to receive the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Peter's revelation that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God was all the authentication he needed to receive authorization to use those multi-purpose keys of the kingdom of heaven. And seeking what's good for the church, we need authentication to access the authorization to protect our revelation for ministry. We are living in perilous times. Prominent psychiatrists, one, the COVID pandemic affected nearly every aspect of life, the death of loved ones, 
losses of jobs and businesses, losses of homes, losses of trust in the government, and in many instances, loss of trust in the church. They say, younger generations are exhibiting high levels of anxiety and depression and that the pandemic's traumas, they say, could lead to a rise in hopelessness and seeking what's good for the church. The church needs authenticated ministries whose leader have authorization to access the kingdom of heaven in order to minister to these pandemic promise. Jesus, the head of the church, said of himself, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. And, and we, the church, who are called out to be the body of Christ, should have that same spirit on us and, and in us so that we will have authenticated ministries. Someone might want to know, if I don't have this authentication, how can I get it, preacher? Well, Peter got it this way. He had a revelation that Jesus was the Christ, the son of a living God. If you have not had that revelation, then here is what you can do. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. Justification is just as good as authentication. Raymond Masbury, the songwriter, penned the words to this well-known gospel, only what you do for Christ will ask. And I lift up this fruit of his labor this morning using the pronoun we. We may build great cathedrals, large or small. We can build skyscrapers grand and tall. We may conquer all the failures of the past, but only, only what we do for Christ will last. We may seek earthly power and fame. The world might be impressed by one's name, but soon the glories of this life will be past, but only what we do for Christ will last. Remember, only what we do for Christ will last. Only what we do for Christ will last. Only what we do for him and seeking what's good for the church will be counted at the end. Only what we do for Christ will last. We must wait for a revelation for ministry. We must wait for authorization to protect and fortify that ministry, and we must have authentication in order to access the authorization to protect our revelation for ministry. God bless you. Amen. Thank God this morning for the preacher, and thank God for the word. It is true that the church of God is built upon Christ, that solid rock. And as the church is built, the church is left with the momentous task of bringing folk to the kingdom. If you've heard that word today, you've found yourself in it. I hope you'll consider not only joining the kingdom, but joining the fellowship of Metropolitan. We invite you to consider that on your screen, there'll be ways of getting up with us. You can call us, 860-527-7087. Our email address is there. If you want to talk with someone, want someone to pray with you as you make this decision, our ministerial team would be delighted to do so. In fact, 
Let me pray with us right now, shall we? God, we thank you for the word today. We thank you for the truth of the word. And we pray that that word will find a lodging place in our hearts. That if we haven't made that decision yet, we'll make it today. If we need to renew our fellowship, we'll do it today. Help us, oh God, to walk with you and you will walk with us. Help us to lean not into our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledge you and your promises are sure and amen that you would direct our path. We lean now, we depend, we trust, we believe in you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be looking for you, my brother, my sister. We want to walk with you. Thank you so much. It's giving time here at the Metropolitan Church. And we get excited about giving because we realize we can give because God has given unto us. There are several ways of giving. By now, you know them. Uh, old school. Write that check, drop it in an envelope, drop that envelope in the mail, and send it to our secured P.O. box, we'll get it. Uh, you may stop by the church office, write that check, drop it in an envelope, use the uh, secured mail slot on the front of the building, we'll get it. Maybe you want to use uh, one of the new electronic portals that we have set up, Cash App or Give Plus. That information will be on your screen. Or maybe you want someone to come by and pick it up. We offer that service as well. Whichever way you choose, I hope your choice will be to give. Because the truth of the matter is whatever you want, God's got it. He's got everything you need. The Chicago Mass Choir is blessing us in the singing and helping us as we give. Come on, let's bless the Lord.
thank you so much for your giving. We're just back from a momentous general conference session down in Atlanta, Georgia last week and late convention. We're excited to see so many across Zion that we have not seen in a spell. And we're grateful to God for what he allowed us to go through in our general session. I hope you'll continue to pray for the denominational church. Many changes going on, many adjustments being made. And the truth is that God can handle whatever seems to be handling us. I'm excited to announce that we have our bishop back, Bishop and Mrs. Proctor, as they complete their last three years of Episcopal service as active bishop, missionary supervisor, they'll be with us and we are excited about it. We also con congratulate your former pastor, my good friend of over 45 years, Bishop Kenneth Monroe, who is now ascended to the spot as senior bishop of the Amy Zion Church. Keep him and Sheila in your prayers as they continue to be a blessing in Eastern North Carolina. Locally here, there are a number of announcements that will be showing at the end of the service. I hope you'll stay tuned. Also in your bulletin, they are there. I hope you'll take note of those things which will affect us in the days and weeks ahead. I'm glad you joined us today. We were blessed by your presence and we hope you were blessed by the offering of worship and praise. Now, the scripture has been read. We have prayed. We have sung the songs of Zion. The preacher has preached. So now it's time to go. And I hope we'll go with these words. Let the church say amen. And then the benediction. God the Son and God the Holy Ghost rest, rule and abide with all of us now henceforth and forevermore. Amen, amen, amen. Make this your response amen. to whatever he said amen. from the healing of your body amen. to the raising of the dead. Amen. How your world is reeling Amen. Battle on through the night Amen. Cause you're gonna win the fight Amen. Even in the valley Amen. Or standing at your Red Sea Amen. Continue to say Amen. Cause your help is on the way Why God has spoken I heard him So let the church say Church. Let the 
to die. 